Hey guys, Mark Demanda here. Hope you had a good Halloween. Um, this is one of the bonus videos I promised. We're going to go and read all the uh, book stuff we got. Let's start with... Lore. First off, Belmont Lineage. Dracula. Dracula. Not even his descendants, the Belmonts, nor the innumerable army of the Brotherhood of Light, have even come close to annihilating him. He is Dracul, of the dragon, an immortal being whose cursed soul is condemned to remain trapped in the body of the vampire, bound to his castle for all eternity. From the beginning, the unbearable yearning for revenge has driven him along the path of iron destruction, a path of infinite suffering and despair, a road that he would now like to leave behind. That's why the power of your god cannot destroy me, because I am his chosen one, Dracula. Marie. The story of Marie goes well beyond one of courage and fervent loyalty. When the mirror revered, when the mirror revealed Gabriel's fate, she was forced to make the most difficult decision a mother ever has to face. She turned her son over to the Brotherhood of Light hid his existence from her own husband, and sacrificed her life for the good of humanity. Despite having died long ago, her memory remains alive in Dracula, awakening the emotions of the man he once was, guiding his actions toward the light and reminding him that the end of his lineage is near. Remember, I am always with you. Marie. Trevor Belmont. The reflection of her innocent of the innocent boy which the mirror of fate showed to Dracula returns to the mind of his repentant father as penance for having condemned him to suffer the eternal curse of a vampire. The moments that he never shared with his firstborn come to life now, as broken fragments of his memory, fitting light against shadow in his dark memories. Putting the broken pieces together seems to be the way to achieve an unknown purpose. That is why young Trevor guides his father through the castle leading him to the furthest reaches of his mind, where the forgotten memories that must be revealed are hidden. He'll pay for what you did to, to me and my mother, Trevor Belmont. Alucard. After the events reflected in the Mirror of Fate, Dracula's firstborn kept away from the human cities, before accepting his new nature. He wandered in the night like one of the godless creatures that he swore to destroy so long ago until he understood that there was nothing he could do now to get back the life that was taken away from him. He could only abandon his own beliefs and fight for the one thing that made sense of his existence. After visiting the tomb of the wife he longed for, he set out alone on a campaign to hunt down the creatures of darkness and watch over the new generations of men. When the Prince of Shadow's castle once again rose from its rubble, the trail led him to his father once again. Trevor died long ago, Father. I am Alucard, a vampire. Victor Belmont. Following the destruction of the Brotherhood of Light by Dracula, the surviving members gathered to begin the search for a new leader to guide them. The last descendant of Simon Belmont. Over the following centuries, the Belmonts commanded the Brotherhood, awaiting the return of the Prince of Darkness. Victor Belmont is, at this time, the last member of his illustrious lineage and the current leader of the Brotherhood. It is a position he has earned by proving he has the valor and honor, and honor necessary in the cause, as well as a complete devotion to safeguarding human lives. Holy relics are in his power, carried by Gabriel in his fight against the Lords of Shadow, which are collected following an endless search through the ruins of the castle. On this day, the destiny, destiny of mankind will depend on the most important decision ever taken by the soldier of God. Will he be able to set, his, set aside his beliefs and prejudice for the good of humanity? I am Victor Belmont, commander of the Brotherhood of Light, protector of humanity, and the last of my illustrious bloodline, Victor Belmont. Brotherhood of Light! Brotherhood Soldier! The boys who prove that they are skilled enough with the sword are recruited by the Brotherhood of Light in their campaign against the forces of evil. The tough physical and mental training they are given makes them very efficient in close combat, providing them with ironclad determination. 
However, if their willpower is not enough, they wear full armor and carry large shields to protect their lives instead as to protect their lives instead. As lower ranking members, the Brotherhood soldiers are sent to their deaths by the their generals with the sole hope of offering them a better fate than their own. Follow me, brothers, for if you do, you will meet a death more honorable than any you could imagine. Cardinal Vicus, Grand Master of the Brotherhood. We've killed a lot of these. Every Brotherhood warrior. When the great werewolves and wargs drastically reduced the ranks of their armies, the wise men of the Brotherhood of Light understood that their style of battle had become obsolete against these enormous creatures. As a solution, they decided to study the hunting techniques of the Wallachia tribes and adapt them to create a new discipline of heavy combat. The warriors chosen to join this new school, mostly cr criminals and ex-convicts, had to be over two meters tall and prove a clear aptitude for violence. Despite the refusal of the most traditional commanders, the heavy warriors ended up becoming a key part of the Brotherhood's war machinery. Hurry up, I want to decorate my shield with vampire blood. Grandmaster Kiasada, Brotherhood General. Brotherhood Cleric. Protected inside their churches and cathedrals, the Brotherhood clerics limited themselves to praying for the lives of their brothers sent into battle. However, the growing threat to their borders had awakened the bellicose nature of the members of, of the school founded by Cardinal Volpe in less fatal times. After years dedicated to the study and worship of the Divine Word, they had gained the favor of God and the catalyst of their own holy as the catalyst of their own holy power. Through their scepters, they materialized their faith in ways as different as calming the nerves of the Allies, launching powerful exorcisms against impious creatures, and even invoking the replacement troops who await their call. Fight without fear, brothers. God will guide your swords to the hearts of the beasts. Augustin of Wigal, High Inquisitor of the Brotherhood. <clears throat> Paladin. I remember this guy. Those who aspire to be paladins are raised in monasteries, educated under the dogma of faith, and trained in the art of war. Their whole life becomes a test in which any mistake, as insignificant as it may be, leads to the complete failure of their mission. Only the purest heart, capable of showing absolute determination and an unswerving faith, will be recognized as God's chosen one. Beyond receiving the admiration of all the f and all the favor of the Council of the Brotherhood of Light, the paladins are rewarded with weapons and armor of gold, forged by the best master blacksmiths from angel bones. Their aim from then until the end of their days is to serve God in the battle against the offspring of evil and guide their troops to victory. I was like you once, but your god showed me another path, Dracula. Siege Titan. Ah yes, this big ridiculous thing. With the upsurge of battles between the Brotherhood of Light and the forces of darkness, the engineers of the Holy Order quickly completed the last great work of Gandolfi. The Siege Titan. It is a giant wood and metal automaton inspired by the stone giants that the forces of Agaria commanded in the Necromancer Wars. For over a decade, hundreds of craftsmen worked to complete the mechanism, powered by the divine energy of the gem that the priests placed in its head. In battle, it would be ready to use its enormous extremities, smashing the regiment with a single stamp of the f smashing a regiment with a single stamp of the foot, pulverizing the walls of the castle with its fists, and dispatching a group of soldiers inside. Its value in war was such that only after after it was built, did the Brotherhood decide to start the siege of Dracula's castle? One word is enough to set it in motion. Destroy! H. Hughes, Master Engineer. Hey, Howard Hughes? Okay. Ah. Zobek. These are Z of the Zobek Society. Zobek was, together with Carmilla and Cornell, one of the old founders of the Brotherhood of Light who answered the call of God, leaving their darkest being on the earth. The Lord of the Dead however, despite his absolute mastery of necromantic magic, could do nothing against the supremacy of Satan, and his existence was relegated to the kingdom of the lifeless. Exhausted and humiliated, he remained hidden for an era, watching over the world of men through his countless spies, extending his influence and preparing his return. When he learned that the power of Dracula had weakened enough, and that the arrival of Satan was near, Zobik materialized once again on Earth. He left behind the arrogance of his past to take on the role of an influential businessman, and he blended in directly with society. 
up to the present. Now he has a new plan, the perfect plan that will pit his two worst enemies against one another, leaving only he, Zobek, to become Lord of All once and for all. You can have the eternal rest you so crave, after all. But first you must help me stop Satan from returning to the world. And for that, and for that, this is my promise to you, old friend, Zobek. Should have known he was, he never planned to help us. Zobek's lieutenant. No one knows the identity of the man accompanying the astute Zobek in his crusade for power. Yes, we do. He's Alucard. It is rumored that he wears armor forged from metal extracted from the abyss, and that he adeptly brandishes a mystical sword by the name of Masamune. Hmm. Capable of going beyond the material realm. Some records indicate that he is the spirit of a damned general. Others, that he is a demon that must pay a debt to death. However, the most popular story is one that classifies him as the result of a necromantic reanimation of a legendary warrior. After all, it would not be the first time that Zobek used witchcraft to create a powerful armed guard. Zobek sent me. He feels you might need my help as you are still weak. Zobek's lieutenant. Death. Countless pictorial and literary references have inspired Zo Zobek's Zobek to shape his true appearance as the most admired character in as the most as his most admired character is described. Death. A legendary skeletal being that ends the life of humans once their role in the world is finished. During an endless period of time in which he was trapped in his domains, the King of Death studied desperately to find new ways of manifesting his power. Using all of his efforts to gather a significant number of souls, he found the way to forge them into a ghostly scythe of extraordinary properties. It is a weapon that will be of great use when his skill of brandishing cutting words is not enough to avoid battle. May you be, may you and your spawn be damned forever. Death. And finally, Servant Corpse. The catacomb on which Satan's chapel of worship was built has served as a tomb of the most prudent parishioners known as the Black Saints, who collaborated in the growth of the church with their lies and money. When their time came, the t cadavers were duly emptied and covered with cloths to keep all disease away from their body and give them their well-deserved eternal rest. That is a privilege that death himself is refusing them now, awakening them and forcing them to fight against the enemy until they are completely exhausted. The most illustrious, enclosed in statues on the walls, retain their vocal cords, intact to call their servants, compensating their limited physical strength with the edge offered by their numerical superiority. Mountains of gold for the mis miserly, rivers of blood for the irate, young virgins for the lecherous. Rejoice, brothers, for in the flames of hell you will find your reward. Chaplain of the Satanic Cult. Army of Satan. Possessed citizen. There are a lot of these <laughs> in the Army of Satan. Like every other night, millions of citizens left their jobs suffocated by their insignificant daily concerns. They would never imagine that a macabre virus was about to r turn them into grotesque, bloodthirsty beasts. After the, after the initial spasms that violently deform their body, these spawns of evil are ready to wreak, wreak havoc in the streets and massacre the survivors as the new members of the Army of Satan. They use their hands, still with fingers, to grab any object that can cause damage and clumsily shoot at the firearms they find. Not that clumsily, they hit me a few times. <laughs> Although it is already too late for them, there is still hope for other humans to receive a vaccine in time. Run. Run, sweet little rats. Soon it won't matter where you hide. You will soon be mine. Raisa Volkova. Satan soldier. Those things, yes. Once the doors of the Avernus were opened, demonic hordes began to invade the earth, unleashing terror and despair among mankind. Pity does not exist for the soldiers of Satan, who carve up their victims with knives of bone and drain their souls through the festering amber bladder that grows on their chest. The brilliant light of the underworld shining from their thorax alone seems to give them uncommon, an uncommon strength. The less fortunate citizens have seen their inner demon unleashed. It is a phantasmagorical snake with a voracious appetite, capable of breaking through walls, armor, and flesh with its powerful jaws. As far as I can tell, the gates of hell have opened under the city. Look for your loved ones and run for your lives. Mark Brennan. He was the news reporter back in episode 3, I think. 
Horned Demon. The demons capable of absorbing an enormous um, number of souls with their purulent bladder develop enough to transform into colossal horned monsters. Their new body, made up solely of muscles, tendons, and stabbing bones, is driven by the tremendous energy provided by the brilliant organ that beats inside them. Dozens of soldiers follow them in search of blood through the human cities. But only the archdemons have the privilege of occupying the front lines of Satan's army. They are the ones that conquer the new world in the name of their lord. Break and smash my enemies, bathe in their blood, and take pleasure in their suffering. Satan. Abaddon. Once the resurgence of Satan became in imminent, Abaddon broke upon the gates of the broke open the gates of the abyss to enable its hordes to pass into the world of men. Nicknamed the Destroyer because of his brutal side and his obsession with devouring everything in his path, he commands his armies by instilling them in the name, by instilling in them the same terror as he instills in his enemies. The Book of the Demons tells his story with runes of fire. He was once an angel under the orders of God, who, corrupted by the promises of Satan, betrayed his own and gave up his wings. His new master kept his word and gave him unmatched ability to destroy his enemies. However, in exchange, he sacrificed every last hint of humanity he might have had in his body and soul. Since then, there is no structure known to contain his fury, no, nor warrior foolish enough to, to face him. His heart, swollen by the power and hatred bestowed upon him by his master, is his only weak point. Master Librarian. Dark Monk. Ooh. Unlike the clerics of the Brotherhood, the Dark Monks do not show their faith through prayer and good deeds. Rather, through the most bloody displays of evil that a human being is capable of carrying out. Their highest aspiration is to earn a place among the ranks of the army that Satan is forming in Hell. So they kill, torture, and terrorize without mercy. The most devout are buried alive, under statues with their likenesses, so that their souls can find their way back when invoked. Without the weight of the material body, their specters receive the favor of their god directly to turn in their demonic power into macabre spells. Projecting mortal energy, or calling Satan's troops, are some of the weapons that they use to proclaim the coming of the new era of evil. The portals, which Satan's monks invoke to allow their troops to pass, are as fragile as the ground that holds them. Master Librarian. Dark Apostle. Ooh. When several dark monks come together in a hellish communion, they acquire the power necessary to hide the arrival of a dark apostle from the eyes of God. They are one of the twelve supernatural entity entities of infinite evil, selected by Satan to spread cruelty in the world of the living. Wherever they go, they take with them the extreme heat of the hell from whence they came, burning all hope with their flaming claws and devastating breath. As long as the litany of the monk lasts, the fiery beasts can continue to manifest their enormous power, ripping souls from men and feeding off their fear. Run to your homes, brothers. Protect yourselves from the servants of Satan, who will soon be with us. Street Prophet. Bioquimic Scientist. Cloning, biological weapons, genetic mutation, and biomechanical upgrades are some of the great achievements of the modern era. To attain them, the biochemic scientists have challenged God directly, deforming his creation with arrogance and pride, breaking the laws of nature or overstepping the bounds of ethics in their search for success and power mean little to them. However, what they have actually found is a life of slavery and torment under the orders of Satan's acolytes. It's too late to repent now. On the brink of the end of the world, mankind will pay for its irresponsibility. The tests on primates, uh, primates have revealed a chaotic mutation of the tissue. Once we have stabilized it, we'll begin to inoculate human subjects. Wolfgang Gerhard, Bioquimic Executive. Golgoth Guard. I despise these creatures. <laughs> Cultivated and raised in laboratories, the Golgoths can be considered the link that connects man and machine in the evolutionary chain. Their cloned bodies have been genetically altered to grow much more quickly and larger than a normal human being. 
Their minds, on the other hand, have not had time to develop. If it was not for implanting strict instructions or suppressing emotions, they would be no different than a child. Their sole aim is to defend the bioquimic from intruders, and for that purpose they are equipped with indestructible armor and an enormous grenade launcher courtesy of the military corporation. I saw you hide there. You're going to die, dog. Ulgoth guard. Ugh, I wish you got to kill at least one of those. Raisa Volkova. Weird picture. Oddly emphasizing her breasts. The director of, bioquimic la of the bioquimic laboratory is an aggressive, unscrupulous woman who is capable of hiding her true appearance from human eyes. Only the beasts of the night can see her for what she really is, a twisted reptilian creature that is as, in that is as intelligent as she is dangerous. During the tong ten long years dedicated to perfecting the demonic virus, she has kidnapped humans, experimented on them, and corrupted each of their cells to turn them into, a so into soldiers worthy of Satan. In battle, she can conduct electricity and move fiendishly fast, even beyond the scope of Dracula's vampiric perception. Only extreme cold can stop her and keep her mind intact for Zobek, who wants to rip the secrets of Satan's acolytes from inside her. I'll promise it'll be short and sweet. Raisa Volkova Raisa Volkova, Satan's daughter. This Final Fantasy-looking thing. In the surprise of both Zobek and Dracula... To the surprise, two of the surprises of both Z Zobek and Dracula, Volkova revealed herself, revealed herself as Satan's first acolyte. She is a giant beast that looks like a winged sphinx with a mouth that extends through her neck and sides, opening into a grotesque orifice lined with teeth that divides her torso in two. The feminine form she no longer retain retains is nothing more than a vestigial hint at her past, confusing her prey as much as the as the demonic eyes on her wings. As the daughter of Satan, she wants to earn her father's pride that he recognize her value over all her other siblings. What better way to do that than to devour her two biggest enemies in a single bite? Look at me, you dirty pigs. Look at Satan's splendid daughter before your very eyes. Raisa Volkova. Nurgle Meslamis... Nurgle Meslamsia. Meslamsia. The new laws passed by the government give each man, woman, and child the right to defend themselves and their families. It is a situation made possible of the military corporation which supplies arms to both police forces and to businesses around the city. That the director, Nurkel Meslamiste, is Satan's second acolyte. He is a cold and proud being, capable of possessing enormous inanimate objects and imbuing them with supernatural powers. However, his ability is not limited to just large mundane objects such as stone statues or heavy machinery. Each weapon that leaves the factory has been imbued with a fragment of his demonic essence, enabling him to influence the minds of those who carry them. I can see that I have underestimated you. Accept my apology. It won't happen again. Nurgle Meslamiste. Riders of the Storm Three imposing stone statues top one of the t castle's tallest towers. They represent wind, lightning, and thunder. The riders of the storm, born of the legends of the east, come down to earth to collect the riches of the men who have asked favors from the heavens. Nurgle, making use of his ability to possess objects, divides his demonic essence to get inside the three figures, giving them life and sa giving them uh, inside the. Divides his demonic essence again inside the three figures, give them life, and set their mythical powers against Dracula. The hissing spear, the shining sword, and the thundering battering ram now point at the neck of the Prince of Darkness, coming to life in the name of Satan. You are excommunicated. Deliver your dark kingdom to us, Nurgle Meslamastie. Guido Sazandor. As humanity prospered under the promises of corrupt leaders and the hope that a blind god would take them in after death, the number of members of the Church of Satan was growing enormously. The main reason is Satan's third acolyte, Guido Sandor, S -S Sandor, a false priest who by day preaches a corrupt version of the word of God and by night soothes the faithful with diabolical promises of salvation. His sermon is directed at sinners, cowards, and the ambitious who are willing to pay any price in exchange for a guide at the end of time. This, the will of the people under his power, means Satan's influence in the world in, 
I mean, Satan's influence in the world increased, making it possible to indoctrinate new bankers, politicians, and journalists through whom the rest of humanity would be subordinate. Complete the glorious face of Satan, the beginning of all consolation, and whose eyes give clarity to the stars. Guido Sandor. San Leviathan. The ancient god responsible for sinking continents during the Great War in the Old World is known by the name of Leviathan. It is a colossal beast reflected in legend as a being of immense cruelty that remains dormant under the caverns over which the city of Castlevania is built, since well before the arrival of the first civilization. Satan, aware of its power, took advantage of, of its state to drag it, in, to drag it to the abyss, where it is chained up and subjected to eternal torture. Converting its suffering into ire and the ire into an unlimited source of energy, the Leviathan filled itself with enough power to reduce the planet to ashes. It is a power that its captor longs to harness and which will determine the fate of all mankind. Suffer, you damned lazy beasts. Feed off the pain and hatred I give you, for when you unleash your ire, you must fulfill your duty. Satan. And, of course, last but not least of these members, Satan. The face of the true evil is rarely seen on Earth in its true form, as as his strong bond with hell prevents it. However, following a long a long wait in exile in the burning abyss, Satan's moment has arrived. For centuries, his acolytes have prepared his return, awaiting the perfect time, gathering the power needed to release him from his bonds and bring him back. Though his hordes preceded him in time, bringing hell to Earth, the fallen angel is not satisfied as no one warned him that the only warrior capable of defeating him was in a position to face him. It's too late now. He has no other options, and the one thing he knows for certain is that he will not be defeated again. He knows Dracula's weaknesses, and he will not think twice about unleashing all the power available to eliminate him. If I cannot rule the world of men, then no one will. Satan. Next, Castle Dwellers. There's a lot here. <laughs> Dishonored Vampire <clears throat> Following the fall of Dracula at the hands of the first Belmonts, the Vampire Knights lost their blood bond and went mad, victims of their own perversion. They cast aside their noble appearance and once again enjoyed the primal pleasures that came to the, that came from the meat of pests returning to the beastly appearance that they shared in bygone times. Finally, with the resurgence of the prince, they came back from their corruption and bowed once more before their lord. They yanked off their wings as pendants for their degradation and forced and forged monstrous weapons with which to expand their vampiric powers. The solemn oath to defend the castle from intruders became their sole mission for the rest of eternity. Only the cursed blood of Dracula is influ influential enough to sway them away from their objective. You're not our lord anymore, dishonored vampire. Dungeon Minion. Ah, uh, these cute little guys. It wasn't long after Dracula's rise to power that the first humans from nearby regions paid homage and swore allegiance to the Prince of Darkness. In exchange for their pathetic lives, they agreed to kill anyone who did not join the cause, whether stranger, acquaintance, or relative. With each murder they committed, their body transformed gradually into that of a foul beast, as if it were a physical reflection of their cowardly and treacherous, treacherous soul. Once they were left without a trace of humanity, they withdrew to the deepest reaches of the castle to defend the interests of their lord under the orders of the dungeon guards. You need you need not fear pain; it will give it will give out. If, you need not fear pain if you give it out first. Dracula, dungeon jailer. Some of the jailers were especially violent and unscrupulous, dismembering their own during the flesh tournaments held under the castle. As a reward for their exploits, they won the right to keep the cadaver and the armor of those who they defeated. Devouring the bodies, they developed their physiques even more, becoming giant masses of muscle. With metal, they forged crude armor, with plates leaving some parts of their back exposed, an enormous hammer capable of breaking any defense when hot. They f the fear they inspire in the rest of their kind make them undisputed masters of the dungeon. As proof of that, they carry a key that gives them access to a section of their territory. If you don't give that key to me now, I will take it from your cadaver. Dracula. Harpy of the Depths Many evil beings have roamed the castle since Bernard's demonic pact was formulated. 
Dracula enslaved most of them when he arrived, adopting only the few that were powerful or wild enough to deserve their freedom. That was the case of the Harpies, ferocious beasts whose appearance has been deformed terribly by years of seclusion underground, far from the mountains they came from. In their new habitat, they protect the rooms of the three sisters while they await the arrival of the new sacrifices with which to soothe their appetite for hunting. Those winged witches are like wyverns in the air, but they are little more than hens on the ground. I'll find a way to make them come down. Bloody Skeleton The souls of the skeleton warriors which Gabriel battled in the past left their bodies in the material world. Free of the spell of the toy maker, their bones have become the tempting target of the cursed blood, which invades and controls them as if they were puppets. Their meatless bodies wrapped in plasma carry their rusty rep weapons to attack their lord once more. No thought is held in their empty skulls other than the urge to run Dracula out, for their, out of their dominion. Nothing can be done to fight against the fluid except to dissolve it with hits or freeze it and split it into thousands of frozen particles. Master Library. Chupacabras! It had always been thought that the Chupacabras was a sort of blood-sucking monster, which later research showed that they were more like mischievous forest creatures that played with the belongings of gullible travelers. However, that later assertion was not entirely true either. In fact, there are not many Chupacabras. Rather, it is a single immortal being that has roamed completely free from time immemorial, causing confusion around the world. It, its incredible, incredible wisdom is only comparable to the originality of its mischief and the value of the relics it carries in its backpack. In its final years, it followed Dracula, who tired of its jokes and locked it up in the deepest dungeon, depriving it of continuing the business established in the castle. Damn duck built platypus, don't run off with my fucking books. Bring back my stuff, you m Bring back my stuff, you mac macrocephalic baboon! And don't you ever come back, Master Librarian. Stone Golem The curse that runs through Dracula's veins becomes more violent the more the vampire delves into his memories. When the blood escapes to possess fragments of the castle, a monstrous stone golem takes shape. Like a puppeteer, the cursed substance controls its limbs and is capable of attacking its master with crushing violence. Trying to defeat it by hitting the bevels, columns, and statues that make it up as laborious as it is inefficient. The true aim is the red flow that animates. Look what you're making us do in a Dracula. Uriales, Theno, and Medusa. An ancient legend about the destruction of the empire of Agaria describes how during the fall of the ancestral gods, three sisters managed to escape the jaws of death, hiding forever in the depths of the earth. The shadows corrupted their hearts and withered their innocence, retaining only their youth as a mass that covers their macabre secret, unaware of the changing world looming over them. The changing world looming over them, they have prospered, obsessed with staying alive in, until the arrival of the end of time. When I arrived here, I envied the dead. Now my entry, uh, now my entrails feed the little girl. I die happy with the pride of a father who feeds his children. Mm. Ledor, Ledorian, Ledorian, Ledorian Brotherhood soldier. Gorgon. When the when the blood possessed the three girls, their obsession became real dragging and tying them together to weave a huge three-headed creature. A set of waving tentacles extended from its body, covering everything it passed, constricting the rock and choking out the beams of the light that filtered across the surface. The beast is described in ancient scrolls with the name of the Great Gorgon. It is a beast with magic pouring forth from its eyes, capable of turning anyone who views it into stone, with a hard skin that reveals its faces and sensitive tentacles as its only weak spots. Only he who learns to use the power of the elements against it will unlock the secret of fire hidden in its heart. When he thought all was lost, the warrior trapped the beast in ice and broke through its protection with the heat of the torch. Master Librarian. Carmilla. Gabriel's profound transformation has caused memories of Carmilla to return to his mind and unleash the dreams that he that the attractive vamp had awakened in him. 
However, the intentions of the Femme Fatale have not changed, and they continue to guide the actions of the warrior towards his doom. The fervent desire to share all eternity with her prince has always been her obsession, and it has ended up poisoning her sweet blood. In a perverse game, she attempts to cloud his judgment, beating him until his will is broken, and delivering him to the most primal temptation. Unfortunately for her, the heart she is trying to control has belonged to another woman for many centuries. I'm yours now. Do with me what you will, Carmilla. Arceus. Agrius. The, mo the biggest fucking asshole in this entire game. When Gabriel defeated the Great Pan, he never imagined that he had altered the natural balance of the world irreversibly. Two mythical spirits, Nomios, commonly known as Pan, and his dark brother Argeus, Agreus, maintain the order of order of life between the species on the planet. So when one dies, the other would drag the weight of nature with him, bringing drastic changes to all his creatures. Ailing and mad with the death of his brother, Agreus unleashed chaos and famine in his wake. Crops no longer grew, entire cities were devastated by the plague, and wild beasts devoured each other. Exhausted, the Dark Fawn retired to a secret garden to plan the most cruel revenge against his brother's killing. Uh, against his brother's killer. I have waited f for this moment for a long time. Now my wait is over. Uh. Toymaker! Gandolfi... Gandolfi's most astounding pupil, loved and admired for his magnificent toys, was fooled by the evil Walter Bernhardt. A prisoner in his castle and a victim of a demonic curse, the toy maker has never stopped making tools of suffering and animating the bodies of the dead for hundreds of years. One day, one of his puppets moved him deeply to, to the point where he wanted to give it his own heart. He gave the small wooden boy, whom he loved like a son, the only organ that had not been corrupted on the condition that he protected from the darkness looming over the rest of his being. His body remained in a glass coffin, forgotten by all except his, for his loyal puppets. Who shall await his return? Your face seems oddly familiar. I'm just a little confused, you see. I suppose my memory will return in time. I make those puppets! One of the first tasks Bernard gave the toy maker before condemning him to slavery was to build an exotic puppet theater to play what is meant to represent the feats of Sir Walter de Grey, an epic story of the knight who defeated the evil dragon Saraga Saraganthorix and saved the entire kingdom. However, the childish nature that the chubby toy, ma toy maker gave to the wooden figures deeply displeased his masters who never allowed them to debut. The colorful puppets were d directed by the puppet master figure, an enormous articulated structure that enabled their master, master to control the play from above. Although they were not created for the purpose of war, their considerable size and tremendous weight makes them fantastic weapons against anyone who enters the home of their creator without permission. Time to play! Toymaker. Inner Dracula. From the arrival of the first night, the curse of the vampire was corrupt. The curse of the vampire has corrupted the hearts of the creatures of darkness, tempting them with supernatural powers and subjecting them to their twisted will. The dark blood has prospered for generations and now runs through the veins of the Prince of Darkness, filling each of his additions actions with ire, hate, and vengeance. There's nothing stronger than its influence except for Dracula's love for his son. It is the last pure emotion he has. His only guide in a world that is falling apart with each step. Defending it means rebelling against his own nature and facing the darkest side of his being. It is a di diabolic image of himself that has been fed by Gabriel's enormous resentment of God. Leaving the body and showing its abominable shape, the cursed blood faces its host in an unprecedented fight that will define his own fate and that of his family. I am the blood that runs through your veins. I am the dark shadow that chills the hearts of men as you pass. I am your fury, your hate, and your vengeance. I am your destiny. Inner Dracula. Next, Castlevania City. We're almost done. <laughs> right, police. These guys. The state of chaos into which the city is been immersed has led the heavily armed security forces to rebel in search of survival and personal gain. Using the advanced combat knowledge acquired at the academy and a total lack of ethics, they ransack and massacre any civilian who crosses their path, 
whether or not they are infected. Their servo armor protects them against the demonic plague through an air filtration system and gives them superhuman abilities, such as two extra arms equipped with knives and protective shields. They also have a jetpack on their backs and that enables them to fight any threat from the air. To kill, they use a drum machine gun and advanced proximity mines that reduce everything within the, the sphere of action to pulp. You'll have to come with us, sir. Hey, perhaps you didn't hear me, sir. Agent 0968. Ugh, riot mech. Hate this thing. The military industry has designed a number of tools of death to give their troops a greater tactical advantage. But few are as twisted and destructive as the riot mech. The operator of this enormous two-legged tank can use combination, a combination flamethrower, grenade launcher, and high-caliber machine gun to defeat a battalion of a hundred men armed to the teeth all by himself. The thick armor gives gives a total protection against impacts, but it has a serious problem with its motor overheating. So to keep the mech from exploding, engineers have divided a solution by two fragile cooling pipes that are temporarily released whenever it be this becomes a problem. Spare no expense. If there's room for another weapon, install it. Barnes Wallace, military engineer. Hooded Man. Which you found out was Victor Belmont. A man with an unknown face walks swiftly through the city, avoiding the wandering dark forces. Zobek notices the enormous power emanating from this being, a power different from that of Satan's acolytes, a power even more familiar. What is this his identity? Where does his energy come from? What activities is he conducting in the city? Soon there will be an answer to all those questions. Be careful, there's a tremendous power close to you. But we know he is... A. Belmont. Hey, thanks for watching. This has been played, recorded, and edited by me, Marek D'Amato. The art was by Rafael Agrona. You can find a link to her commission page below. And uh, I'll see you all next time. Ciao.